ESF is the oldest, largest, and most distinguished institution in the United States that is focused on the study of natural resources and the environment. Hello and welcome to this edition of Improve Your World with SUNY ESF. I'm Dave White. Today's program features a lecture from one of the world's leading conservation biologists, Dr. James Gibbs. He explains the effort underway to save the snow leopard. I'll be talking a lot about Sergei Spitsen. He's a, 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 a biologist in the Russian uh, protected area system and uh, at one of the oldest protected areas in Russia, the Altaisky Zapovednik. Um, Sergey spends about nine months a year in in the field. He's out there as we speak, um, and uh, I'll be, be featuring uh, Sergey quite a bit. Misha Paltsin is here, um, sitting over here. Misha is uh, uh, a conservation biologist with WWF Russia, and is also, to our great fortune, uh, uh, working on a PhD degree here at SUNY ESF. And uh, Misha could be giving this talk as, as easily as I could, uh, and I uh, hope you'll avail yourself of Misha's uh, the, the good fortune that we have Misha here. I have a long-term collaborator, Jennifer uh, Kastner in, 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 in San Francisco, runs the Altai project, and we spend a lot of time trying to find funding to do everything I'll be describing. Okay, snow leopards. Um, we're all familiar with Peter Matheson's snow leopard. It's almost synonymous that the snow leopard is a creature of Nepal, maybe Bhutan, uh, Tibet. Uh, but you can see this creature has an extraordinary range. Um, it's, uh, and you can see far to the north, a lot of people are sometimes surprised to hear that there are snow leopards in, in, in Russia, uh, but you can see it comprises or comprised at one of the major parts of the whole entire species range. Uh, vast, uh, vast range for any vertebrate creature, very sparsely distributed now, perhaps as few as 3,500 snow leopards left on Earth, as many as 7,000. That's a, sort of like Don's 50 to 500 uh, expected guests were operating under the same uncertainty with, with snow leopards. Um, but uh, the part, the region that I want to describe to you today, all the work is at this extreme northern segment of, of the species range, right up here where China, Kazakhstan, Mongolia, and Russia all meet in the Altai Cyan ecoregion, the famous Altai or Golden Mountains. And it is a spectacular place. Um, this is the Ukuk Plateau, um, kind of a really iconic site in, 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 in the Altai. Um, it's a beautiful picture, but it's also quite uh, captures the high elevation taiga, the the, the glacier, perennially glaciated peaks. This is the headwaters for uh, for rivers that run all the way to the Arctic um, north. Um, off of this is the absolute uh, top of top of top of the watershed. You can see the the water here is is milky with glacial flour, the rock that gets ground up by the by the glaciers. There are, it's, it's very, very complicated uh, culturally, linguistically, about 40 languages spoke by 5 million people in this vast Altai Cyan area. Um, um, Kazakhs, for example, Muslims in the south, um, uh, uh, a lot of Mongolian influence from the east, and then the Altai people themselves with the Altai language, um, often shamanic in their uh, religious spiritual orientations. It's a very, very complicated and very, very fascinating place culturally. So snow leopards are um, fascinating creatures. They're icons of this high elevation, remote, sparse, rugged, montane region. They are beautifully adapted to living in these conditions. They are, um, just in terms of adeptness and uh, ability to well, to make a living in this landscape, pursuing incredibly agile prey across cliffs, and uh, they are, are, are just uh, in, in incredibly well honed and adapted to, to, to these circumstances. Um, uh, parse together some, some game camera images as videos. I did this this morning. You are indeed the first people to see these. Um, I think they tell you more about snow leopards than... Uh, than, uh, than any number of still images or graphs or tables and figures. I, these are very interesting animals. They are, um, this is the same site, um, uh, the same marking spot. Um, and uh, basically, they are solitary. They do occur at low densities. They're top predators, but they are, um, they do find ways to communicate. This is a snow leopard, uh, <laughs> snow leopard social networking site. This is now checking uh, the, the message that the chemical message that the fox just left, um, but these are uh, these animals. Basically, they they are uh, 
they they do communicate and form social networks through through these extended uh, systems of marking. I like this particular sequence because you've got a little bit of everything. You've got a sense of the interaction between the carnivores and the community, and this is the primary prey for uh, for snow leopards. These are Siberian ibex, and I noticed that the snow leopards skedaddled about 10 minutes before the ibex uh, showed up in this particular sequence. So I don't know what happened next. This animal you can see with its mouth open. It's just disappeared, but it, what it did <laughs> was it, it, it came around the far side and uh, checked out the camera. <laughs> You can see it has its mouth wide open. It's, 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 it's a way of sensing heavier compounds uh, in the sense that other animals leave. Um, but uh, So these are solitary animals. Um, they are top predators. They're mainly eating ungulates, uh, deer, but especially ibex, uh, wild sheep where they're available. Um, but also they'll take small mammals, marmots, um, and, uh, and some of the larger game, game birds, grouse. Uh, and the like. And we, uh, this is a, just a good look at, at the Argut River Basin. It's actually really wonderful snow leopard habitat. If you may have gotten the impression that snow leopards only live in rock and ice, that's kind of where they've been pushed to. Um, they actually do very well in forested areas, river bottoms. Um, they just no longer have the opportunity to live in such areas. So this is the, the Argut um, and uh, the river itself snaking down through that valley. We spent a, a whole year, basically a whole fall, winter, and spring uh, camera trapping and got some absolutely wonderful pictures. We learned a lot about the wildlife in the Argut Basin. This is just a really spectacular ibex ram. You can see here uh, um, uh, posing for the camera. Um, this was almost too good to be true. Male-male uh, uh, in interaction right in front of the camera with the, with the kids off to the side. Uh, um, we have really learned a lot in terms of the, the, uh, the, the wildlife population that was there. In terms of, uh, <laughs> yes, there's camera shy animals and then there's the opposite. Um, <laughs> but we're really astounded to see the volume of, of prey. Um, this, in any case, they're estimated to be four to 5,000 um, ibex in the primary prey of snow leopards in this region, which was really great news. The prey base looks to be in excellent shape. Uh, elk as well, um, mor uh, morale, and uh, this is a curious creature. It looks like a dog. It's actually a deer, a musk, musk deer, um, with that sort of a toothed deer. Um, this is also a, an important ungulate in, in, in the region, and uh, <laughs> massive, massive uh, marmots or groundhogs, uh, uh, the scale that we can't even envision, um, that are really important ecologically as far as moving soil around and changing plant communities. Um, other predators, so a good intact herbivore community. Um, uh, lynx here. Uh, lynx is also a fairly vulnerable species, but uh, um, uh, but lots of lynx. Uh, equivalent of the grizzly bear um, was showing up in the cameras, and uh, and of course wolves. Wolves are, are really quite common in Altai. We now have a pretty good picture of the area and the animals living there. Coming up why the snow leopards are disappearing. This is a traditional landfill cover. This stand of shrub willow is an effort to develop an alternative landfill cover system that will also create a wildlife habitat, park and recreation area, and biomass for use in energy production. We are using these willows to control the movement of water. Uh, into, the, into the waste material to uh, essentially keep the water from coming in contact with the waste because that, uh, when that happens you get chemicals that will be, uh, become transported by the water as the water moves through the waste material. So we're trying to keep those contaminants from being transported outside these boundaries and into the groundwaters and surface waters that are adjacent to the site. And so far, the shrub willows are doing a good job preventing water from soaking deep into the ground. Eventually, 60 acres of this former industrial site will be planted in shrub willow. 
what has happened to snow leopards across much of the region had happened here as well, but unfortunately to the core population, the largest, they had been snared out. That is actually a snow leopard uh, sniffing a scent marking uh, point with a snare around its neck. And, um, and so uh, basically in the huge transition that the region has undergone, political systems and economic systems has ch have changed. There was a, a period of, uh, of uh, a lot of activity by poachers, a lot of uh, un uh, unregulated activity that, that uh, has led to the, 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 the leopard apparently being stripped out from this, from this core area. And so they end up, uh, there's a huge demand for these creatures. It's, it's hard to catch them, it's hard to get them, but the, the global economy as it is uh, reaches deep down into these remote regions. Maybe the, the, the local person maybe gets $200 or, um, or so for the animal, but they sell for much more, all parts of them, fur, bones, uh, cartilage, and, uh, and, and furs, of course. Uh, this is uh, in a village where this is uh, in a town, just to show you sort of the supply chain in a town nearby. And uh, this is a snow leopard available for sale. And then somewhere far, this is a confiscated uh, uh, animal, but this is will command, command a high, high price in a, in, a, in a rich foreign capital somewhere. Um, and so this is uh, these, these the, the, the economic draw is tremendous and it reaches all the way into these areas. So despite no snow leopards um, in this first round in the, in the main and lower part of this Argut River Basin, um, the decision was still made to move ahead um, and to, a, uh, to, to, to look at the whole issue of poaching and particularly snaring. This is a protected area, an entirely protected area where our um, um, hunting is not, not permitted as a, it, it is a good model to explore in for conservation elsewhere, but in this particular area, it's, it's a vast area that is protected. One of the first steps is to establish these anti-poaching brigades. And these are local people um, provided with some basic uh, equipment, binoculars, um, and uh, for and cameras and video video cameras for, for evidence gathering and, and some basic training to go out and, uh, and to scout out these areas. This is uh, the first sort of presence of, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, people in the region um, working really toward conserving these creatures. That, um, and uh, I have a lot of photographs here. Just I am utterly fascinated as a person who loves wilderness and utterly in awe of the people who do this work. They are uh, primarily local, local, fellow, local folks um, who are who, who better. They know the geography. They can deal with the conditions. They are, are out there as we speak, um, and uh, and uh, just under really difficult conditions to do this work. Um, sometimes this is on skis, sometimes it's by horse. Uh, actually, the area is much easier to penetrate in the winter because the rivers are frozen, and they can be uh, in the in the in the spring, summer, and fall. They're flowing, and it makes makes navigating a lot more complicated. Um, I don't know if you've encountered a, a tent with a wood stove inside it, but that's what you're seeing there. Um, the temperature can get down to negative 40, occasionally negative 50 Celsius. Un unbelievable. Um, and, and they still, still work under these conditions. Um, but also just cleaning snares out of the environment. Snares are, are really nasty because they're just, uh, they're persistent. Um, they're functional for years until they catch something or until rust catches up with them, but that's very, very unlikely. They're just, and even people can set up a bunch of snares and find some other occupation and they're still out there working away. So cleaning out snares has been a big occupation of these patrols and literally kilos and kilos have been removed from, from the Argut River Basin. It's not just direct poaching on snow leopards, it's poaching of their prey. So keeping track of where kills are occurring and, and who's, 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 who's doing this is an important part of this. Collecting, uh, the crew collects very detailed information on, on where they find uh, snares and, and poachers and sign and uh, this is all um, useful information to try and tackle this in a more scientific way to predict where, where, where people are active and, and less active and such. And also uh, we've been uh, uh, um, bringing some technology to help the efficiency of these patrols. Um, this was work started with Steve Gulick who I see just arrived uh, and this is uh, basically bringing some pretty cutting-edge technology to, uh, to, um, to Altai um, for a very particular purpose, and that's to help the, if the patrols, these are vast areas and it can be quite discouraging to go for days and days to monitor ambient temperature. And when there's a big 
uh, a big jump in temperature to send a signal out um, via, via satellite. And that's what you see here. These are your classic spot units. I'm sure some of you outdoors people have these that you push a button, they, they send a message to your family and friends where you are. It's just uh, using that, that technology. Um, you can see them weatherproofed inside a small clear top pelican case. Buried in the roof of a poacher's cabin, the sensor is down inside, just uh, invisible inside the cabin. And with a big uh, motorcycle battery working all winter long, just monitoring the temperature for, for, for a sudden change, which would indicate a fire and someone present there. And that's what you see here. This is Sergei doing the final installation on this cabin. And uh, in the fall, before the snow arrives, and this becomes completely cryptic. So it's kind of strange to bring this cutting edge technology into a, uh, such a remote area, but it works very well. And this is the basic idea, the sensor communicating by satellite to someone monitoring a computer that communicates with a satellite phone back to the field crew and tells them, oh, there's somebody over here. Curiously, Sergei also has one of these units, and he also said he's here today. Um, and, uh, and there's presumably communication on the, on the other side by satellite phone. It'll, it's quite a trek from where Sergei is today to where I, we presume the cabin is being used despite finding no snow leopards. Just uh, the thought of maybe restoring them someday or um, pu pushing on the anti-poaching, uh, it really has made a big, a big difference. Like the number of snares has dropped by, I think, 70% was the latest estimate in, in the region. And um, confiscated weapons, and, uh, and uh, we'll return to this whole issue uh, later in the talk, but it, this has made a, a big difference in terms of just cleaning up the environment, making it safer for, for snow leopards should they return. So this was a bit disappointing at first, uh, but um, Sergei and his crew kept looking. Most of our, the original surveys had been in the main part of the Argut and Shavla rivers, uh, um, most accessible parts, but not, neither time nor resources to get to the real extreme edges of this. Um, and Sergei continued uh, years thereafter um, looking for snow leopards and uh, using all means, horses, again, skis, foot, um, to get into these areas. And um, lo and behold, at the very sort of extreme uh, headwaters of, of, of this whole basin found these tracks, snow leopard tracks. Um, and Sergei um, installed a, a whole set of cameras wherever he had earlier seen these tracks. And, um, and uh, we were very, very thrilled to see um, well, it turns out there are snow leopards after all in the Argut, this former largest of Russian um, snow leopard populations. This is these. I'm just fascinated by these marking sites and the frequency with which they're visited and the multitude of species which are sort of simultaneously monitoring this. This is a wolf also coming in to check out who's in the area. Um, uh, and uh, here's the snow leopard back again. You can see the times and dates. These are just uh, December... Uh, 30th of, of last year, marking away. Um, this is a very, I'll show you, this is a, quite a sighting. That's a manul. That's uh, one of the other 22 wild species of cats. And this I find very interesting, the ibex coming in to check out the snow leopard marking area. Presumably this is for self-preservation purposes. Um, <laughs> but uh, we didn't really realize that they did this. Um, but they're clearly doing this. I just want to show you this, uh, this manul. This is a very unusual uh, creature. Um, this is a tiny, um, um, it looks like a house cat, but it's a, a pretty ferocious house cat. It's a, it's, it is a small wild cat. And again, one of the, the very few wild cats on earth that pop up in strange places uh, on these cameras. We would not know otherwise that they were present. So some good news then that uh, snow leopards are, are in fact still present in the area. Who knows where these came from? They may well have come from, from Kazakhstan to the south. It might have been there all along, um, but uh, the, this was then encouragement, and then we had this investment in hardware with cameras, et cetera, to go look for snow leopards elsewhere um, and to see how they're doing. These poplar trees are hard at work, cleaning up what was a landfill. It's a process called phytoremediation. Well, phytoremediation is the use of plants to clean up environmental contamination. So we can look at using plants to take up and sequester heavy metals 
or in the case of these poplar trees, to take up organic compounds and break them down into non-toxic byproducts. Yeah. Well, if you put something in a landfill, you are putting it in there and keeping it safe and not letting anything come in contact with it, which means whatever you put in there is staying in there. It's not going away. In some cases, the trees can be harvested and safely turned into useful products. On the other hand, if the contaminant is a heavy metal like lead or chromium, phytoremediation offers a recycling opportunity. And we can reclaim that metal by harvesting the plants and extracting the metals from them. So we're completely removing it from the environment rather than just putting it someplace and keeping it there for future generations to have to deal with. So this takes us to slightly different parts, more to the east, uh, toward Mongolia, so with the crew redeploying these cameras. And, um, well, then it became not such great news. The camera's starting to pick up... Uh, 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 um, uh, um, snow leopards all over. Not such great news. Not such uh, extraordinary news. Uh, these are uh, the. Um, there are several sites now where there are, are very regular contacts with 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 snow leopards. This is over toward uh, still in Russia, over toward the Mongolian Tuvan border. Um, but you can see uh, just a, a sense of a snow leopard in its um, in its typical habitat. I just had to add this because these are ibex coming in the other direction shortly thereafter. Ibex in the middle of shedding their winter coats um, in, in July. They look uh, quite... Uh, I'm glad it didn't decide to butt the camera. It looked like it thought about it for a moment. At this point, this was a really significant photograph because this is a mother and cubs. They have uh, one to five cubs, usually one to two they stick with their mother for a couple of years. But this was also good to know that there's reproduction going on. Some of these animals get so sparsely distributed, they just basically can't find one another. The chemical communication system that snow leopards use helps reduce that distance, but that, these are just needles in haystacks in this vast area. So it was really nice to see reproduction. And this is a, um, two, more, uh, two more cubs slightly to, to, to the east of that particular and, and north of that site. So. This was very gratifying. Really figure out what's going on, you need some help. And this is Eric. Um, Eric is a, is a, a German shepherd, as you can see, uh, specially trained uh, for scenting and finding snow leopard um, sign, and particularly snow leopard droppings. And uh, everyone finds it a challenge in the deep, deep of winter. Basically, there's odors don't carry well at negative 40 Celsius. So Eric is quite effective, except in the bleakest part of the winter in wind and, 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 and ice. But uh, he's really helped in terms of uh, so Sergei collecting feces that otherwise would have been very difficult to find, uh, popping them in a tube to eventually extract DNA to help. Uh, this is scratch marks, uh, snow leopards uh, on, on, on trees. Eric has been very helpful in, in helping to locate these samples so that they can be analyzed to help move us a little bit farther ahead in terms of what extra population sizes might be out there. At this point, they've showed up now um, on the, uh, all through these areas. I've another area here. Um, and uh, it's, it's very, very encouraging that there are at least a, animals out there that can, can uh, ultimately serve as nuclei, nuclei to, to repopulate this region if the protections are in place. The prey, for the most part, in, at least in the Argut Basin, is, is in incredibly good shape. And these are three guys they spent, a, I think, 10 days with from one of the villages. There's only 200 people in the Argut um, River Basin in, in two different villages. And I, I look at this picture because I see these are these are folks that like, uh, want they they well, want a better life. They want more economic opportunity, and they'll get it however they can. And they're part-time hunters, part-time poachers. And uh, but if they have another way, an easier way to make money, they'll respond to that as well. Coming up, a plan to improve economic opportunity and thereby save the snow leopard. Cutting into the root ball. Am I killing these roots? You betcha. Is the plant going to grow more? You betcha. You got to dig a big enough hole. You always dig wide, not deep. Uh, it's much more important that you have at least at least twice the diameter of the uh, root ball that you're putting in the ground. You should have a hole at least twice. And sometimes in, in heavy clay soils, you want at least three times that diameter. You feel ridiculous yeah. when you dig this. You get a wide hole about the size of a bathtub, you put in this relatively small tree. But 
it really makes a big difference. The, the topmost root should be right, right at or even just slightly above the surface of the soil. You can either double or half the life of a tree on the day you plant it. So if you, if you do everything right, um, most trees will grow for the best part of a century. Even fairly, quote, short-lived trees will grow for 50 or 60 years. So there are some immediate uh, ways to, to help, uh, help the situation. And, uh, and uh, as I was just mentioning, with uh, some of these conflicts with snow leopards are real, and they're, they're tremendous. And uh, um, they, uh, snow leopards, not, not frequently, but, but, but when they do, they can have an enormous impact. We'll find their ways into herders, um, um, herders' homes and into the corrals where they bring in the, the animals at night, uh, mostly uh, uh, to deal with, with wolves. Um, but uh, one snow leopard, uh, these you can see brought in into these, these, these uh, covered corrals. Uh, this is the breathing hole for the whole mass of sheep, maybe 100, 150 sheep inside. If a snow leopard gets in that hole, two things go happen. They usually go berserk and they can kill 50 or 60 animals at a time. And that is absolutely devastating to a herder. We're putting together a program uh, identifying, cooperating, collaborating herders who live in areas with snow leopards and, um, and actually providing them with binoculars, providing them with game cameras and providing the training. And if they can demonstrate that um, during the course of a year, they have, and, and the demonstration of the documentation is in the form of the images from the cameras that these snow leopards have persisted in amongst them, um, they can receive a very significant uh, 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 financial reward, uh, about $3,000, which might not seem like much, but that's three times uh, the typical annual per capita income. It's a, it's a huge infusion of, and, uh, and we're looking and are in the process, we have uh, various donors that, are, that are, are helping to pull this together. So it's not just adopt the leopard, it's adopt the family, because then there are other ways that this can work through, through uh, peer pressure, and uh, if a family is doing well by snow leopards, they'll, they'll want to maintain that situation. We're also embarking on a conservation tourism, um, still searching for the right term here, but uh, basically to bring in paying um, guests from usually from, uh, from outside who actually want to visit these spectacular areas and uh, help uh, um, uh, contribute to conservation as citizen scientists, if you will, participatory scientists, uh, and uh, we, we piloted this two years ago by bringing, um, inviting uh, a group of ESF students. Uh, here they are. Um, and I think Jim is here. Uh, Jim, Meredith, Elizabeth, so, some others. We, we spent uh, 12 or so days traversing a huge area, um, giving this a try. This tourists need transport to get around. This is in the form of horse, horses. They need food to eat. This is kind of a, not, not a typical meal, so it's kind of a final, final uh, meal, but you can see it's uh, mostly local food. Um, so the idea is then to, to provide some opportunity then for locals to, to help with this, and also to serve as guides, cooks, and, and others. And the tourists then uh, really can contribute in a significant way. These are measuring Argali skulls, um, uh, but uh, the kind of leveraging that they can do uh, for just in terms of eyes and legs and uh, time and opportunity to, to go out. And, and it takes a lot of time to survey these areas. Uh, they're big areas, they're vast uh, sweeps. Just had to show you, these are um, Argali. These are um, the largest of the wild sheep. And this uh, and one of the big targets then will not only be camera trapping and uh, involving the, the paying tourists in that, but also in, in surveying, uh, doing visual surveys for these uh, very rare um, very spectacular um, wild wild sheep. The, uh, to move all these programs ahead, it's pretty modest uh, the, in terms of about $40,000 a year for the next five years could restore Russia's largest snow, popula snow leopard population, the Argut, back to its original numbers. But I just want to end here again um, with a quote from George Schaller. Uh, when the last snow leopard has walked among the crags, the mountains will become stones of silence. It's, uh, it's quite, quite compelling. And uh, leave you with that and thank Dale and Sigrid again for making this all possible. That's it for this edition of Improve Your World with SUNY ESF. Thanks for joining us. We hope to see you again next time.